All right, so thanks for joining me here today. Um, I'm guessing most people here already kind of know who I am, but uh, just to, once again, for those who didn't hear me say it the first time, uh, my name is Stephen Waddell. I work here on campus at the Distance Education Department. Um, I get to work with some of their coursework. So uh, my official title is Immersive Media Developer, but I get to occasionally delve into some things that are more on the design side. I honestly say that's probably more of what I work on on a daily basis. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, something that you're going to run into if you're ever doing anything involving rendering, real time or not, uh, materials and textures. Um, so we'll be going into an overview of what exactly material is, how you go about generating one, and a little bit later on we'll go ahead and bring some into Unity so we can take a look there. So this is a, just a razor that I made for the previous uh, presentation I gave on this in Blender 2.79. So you guys did a workshop on Blender recently. This should seem pretty familiar. So when we talk about materials, what we're describing are a set of inputs that are going to go into a shader. And the shader is a program that draws, or may draw, something to your screen. Uh, so I'm going to go into a little bit of the nitty gritty here, but I'm not, not going to spend too much time here. Uh, the last time I gave this workshop, we talked about shaders and inputs the whole time, and it didn't seem very helpful. So instead, I'm going to run through this, and we're going to get to more of the practical stuff real fast. But essentially, when we talk about shaders, we're talking about part of the GPU pipeline that's going to actually draw the thing to the screen. Um, and your textures are part of that input. So can think of the material as all of your inputs and the textures are part of those inputs that go into your shader. So materials have changed a lot since I first downloaded Unity back in middle school. Um, like a lot, a lot. So things like this are basically a single uh, sphere that has, a tessel or has tessellation applied and a height map. Uh, and this way textures are kind of replacing modeling to some degree, at least on at certain detail levels. And we'll go ahead and take a quick look at this. ArtStation, by the way, if you haven't heard of it, is a wonderful website to take a look at different materials, artworks, 3D work. And this is made by jo uh, Joshua Lynch. Go through some of this here. And this is entirely parametric. So not only is this material taking a sphere and making it a rock, uh, but it's been made entirely using a node graph in a, in a tool called Substance Designer. And we'll talk very briefly in a moment about what these different maps here are. Um, but essentially this is the textures that's making up the material. And it's being rendered in a uh, render toolkit called Marmoset Toolkit. Uh, it's very common to use for display. It's also really great for baking ambient occlusion, but it is not free. so. One of the reasons I won't be going into it too much today. There we go. Okay, so that's what a material really does for a surface. You can take everything from a sphere to a basic mesh and do crazy things with it. Um, what materials are as a pipeline? This is a very simplified uh, version of a very exhaustive explanation of exactly what your GPU is doing when you tell it to render something on the screen. Um, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to go into much of this, uh, but this is very useful for understanding what you're doing when you're looking at things like vertex shaders and pixel shaders. Uh, and this is taken from Real-Time Rendering, a great book that I can recommend. Uh, but essentially, what tends to happen whenever you're rendering something, your CPU will tell your GPU, here's a bunch of stuff I want you to put on the screen. The GPU is going to start by organizing those things, that's the vertex shading portion. Um, and this is where you can alter the points that are going to go in to make up that mesh. Uh, from there, you're going to go through various stages to prepare that geometry for the screen. Um, this goes into projection, clipping, and screen mapping. Essentially, all of those things are oriented around taking that mesh, making sure that it's actually going to be drawn on your screen, and preparing it for that process. 
From there, we actually start drawing the colors to the screen. That's the rasterization process. Uh, we go through triangle setup, which finish, finishes all the work from geometry processing. Triangle traversal will start to give us information about what colors are going to be assigned from our textures to our meshes. And then pixel shading is where you can go in and make a number of creative adjustments. This is where you can integrate your lighting from your environment. And it's also where you're going to be able to do some really fun visual effects. Um, so we can take a look at one of those, or a few of those in Shader Toy in a moment. Um, but first I'd like to pull up an example of a vertex shader. And this is used for a bit of software called A-Frame. Um, anybody here is familiar with it? It's essentially a web, it is a web VR renderer. And it's, it's even more than that, you can essentially use it as a game engine. And here you can see this kind of cloudy drawing here, and see little binoculars here. So it's uh, A-Frame was made uh, to basically make web web VR more accessible, um, and it does a great job for that. It's also very useful for web AR, which uh, I've gotten to look a little, a little bit for that recently. So what the shader is essentially doing, I can pull the JavaScript here, uh, is it's taking a sphere and it's mapping out that sphere to different points. Uh, oriented towards its normal using Perlin noise. So that may have sounded, I mean, some of you might be more familiar, to some that may have sounded a bit more like a jumble of random words. Uh, but basically we're telling it where to put those points. And then later on it's also giving it some information on shading, which is how we're getting these color values. Um, that's essentially one of the things that you can do with a vertex shader. Now for uh, Fragment shaders, we can go to Shader Toy. This is a really awesome website. If it doesn't crash on me, I will continue to, to praise it. Um, everything in Shader Toy is essentially a fragment shader. And when we say fragment, that's essentially interchangeable with pixel. Um, some people would uphold that fragment is a better term because it's not really a pixel yet, but it's basically a pixel, so no reason to split hairs. So fragment shaders can be really interesting for a number of reasons. You can actually change your uh, render process entirely. And instead of using the traditional render pipeline, decide to instead do things like um, shoot a ray from the camera at the scene, and using a function that you define in your shader, make things like parametric spheres. Uh, and there's a few other more basic, well, I say basic. There's a few other crazy things you can do with uh, fragment shaders. It's worth noting that while Shader Toy is really cool and, and you can get a lot of really awesome effects from it, uh, it's not super applicable to Unity necessarily because in a lot of cases um, you're not really using the meshes. You have a singular, uh, single plane and you're defining what's in that plane using just the uh, pixel shader. This is an example of a fractal that you can also draw using a ray marching technique. And this is just essentially a three-dimensional function uh, that's being evaluated by a ray that we're casting from the camera. And with that, I'm going to try to avoid talking too much more about shaders. Um, of course, if you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer them at the end of this. But for now, let's go, go ahead and move on to talking about where we're going to use materials and how. So custom shaders are all well and good, and they're awesome, but in most cases, if you're working in Unity, Unreal Engine, or Blender, you're going to have a standard shader that's going to use uh, PBR. Um, physically based rendering, not perhaps blue ribbon. Uh, so essentially, when we talk about physically based rendering, this is sort of a paradigm shift from an older style of material editing uh, that favors more of an actual physical base to how we look at materials over something that may have made more sense before ray tracing was a kind of part of the process. Not really a real time process, but. So when we talk about physically based rendering, um, a few important points that you might run into. Uh, 
when we look at the diffuse map for physically based rendering, it's essentially just colors. Um, we use metalness and the roughness of a surface to determine uh, things like shading, glossiness, uh, reflections, um, at least in an ideal world. Now, there's definitely still an artistic touch to some of these things, but um, that's the entire concept behind physically based rendering is that in a perfect environment you can get a photorealistic texture uh, using a standard set of inputs. So instead of writing your own shader, almost everything is going to have a standard that you can work with. And this was about metalness or specular. Um, really the only thing you need to know about that is just blurb at the bottom. Um, metalness workflows tend to be preferred because you can't really have things that are kind of metal. They're either a dielectric or metallic. Um, some people still prefer specularity because it gives you more creative control. It's kind of a personal preference thing unless you have a favorite game engine, in which case they'll probably have made the decision for you or they might have multiple shaders available. Uh, so whenever we talked about textures as inputs to materials, this is one demonstration of all the potential textures that you can have that define the material. Um, in a, in a PBR-style workflow, you usually will have a color map. You're going to have a normal map of some kind, in most cases, a roughness map, and you might have a height map. Um, ambient occlusion might or might not be added. Uh, there was some talk about getting rid of that at some point, um, but it's kind of still stuck around. So to go through a very quick definition of all of these, your color map is giving you your color. That's pretty simple. Um, it'll always look a little bit more washed out than you'd expect it to be. That's because we're not going to get any shadows or shading or uh, surface uh, sort of surface variation with the color map, unless it's part or unless it's part of the particle that we're rendering. Um, when we look at normal maps, that has to do with normal shading, which I believe we're going to go into very shortly. Um, but essentially, your normal map is going to change how the how the renderer is going to render the lighting of your object. Um, roughness is specifically referring to how shiny or rough the surface is. Uh, in a more physical sense, it's talking about how uh, coplanar, the, the, molecu the, the, the molecular surface of the structure is. So how shiny it is, I guess. Uh, amb ambient occlusion is referring to self-shading. So every material is going to have some amount of uh, curvature or uh, inward facing um, uh, interior bounces of light. So that's going to make it darker in some areas and lighter in others. Uh, ideally, the best renderer is going to be able to do this for you, but you're not really going to be able to rely on that in real time to any reasonable degree. So ambient occlusion bakes a little, a little bit of that into the material for you so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and it's kind of important to go over normal mapping. Um, essentially, there was a point when normal mapping as a technique wasn't very popular. Uh, that has very much changed. It was one of the first shading techniques that could be expected to really increase visual fidelity at a fairly reasonable trade-off to performance. Uh, there still is a trade-off, but it's much more reasonable. Uh, essentially, whenever we talk about a normal vector, we're talking about the surface of whatever mesh you're trying to render. So every single uh, mesh you can put into a game engine is going to be made up of triangles. Every triangle is going to be facing a particular direction. And we define this direction as a normal vector. Uh, when I say vector, does that make, make sense? Um, OK. <laughs> uh, so when we use a normal map, we're essentially telling the renderer per pixel, here's what the actual vector we want to use for the lighting is. Um, so this mesh right here is obviously not very high detail. It's kind of a blob. Um, and you can see the lighting on that mesh as if it was using the surface normals present for the triangles. And it's pretty rough. Uh, using a well-made normal map, we can get the result on the far left there, um, which looks a lot better. Uh, essentially, this is giving us a different vector per vertex for our lighting system. And that's telling us how much light is being reflected in a particular direction, how much of it is going to hit our camera, and in some cases, if you're baking lighting or if you're working in a non-real-time system, how much of that light is going to reflect off of that object and hit other things in the, in the environment. All right. 
so we've gone through all of this stuff and talked a little bit about what materials are and how they work. Uh, let's talk a little, a little bit about how we're going to make them. So there's a variety of different ways to make materials. Essentially, any way that you can put pixels to uh, an image will be able to, to make a material. Um, but there are three ways that I've decided to highlight tonight because they seem very, or they seem more common, and I can pull some of the software that we use to make them up on my computer, and I can show you guys. So, um, if you know of any other methods, I'd be more than interested to hear about them. Now, why did I click that? And that happened. Oh, these are links to ArtStation. I forgot that. So photo manipulation. This is kind of one of the older ways, or the oldest way to do photorealistic materials. Uh, has anybody in here played Stalker? About uh, Half-Life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got one. Um, I, knew, I knew we would have played Half-Life. Um, so at some point you basically take photographs of different objects, and there would be certain conditions that would make more sense than others, and you would just take that color information and throw it directly on the model. We're well past that at this point, but what we can do with photogrammetry and other photo ma manipulation techniques. Um, it can be as simple as taking a photograph and throwing it into Photoshop using the normal map generator, or as complicated as generating a full photogrammetric material and then baking that down. And I'm actually going to show a little bit about that, but um, the links here is actually kind of interesting. So. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Substance because I'm going to be talking a lot about it in the remainder of this, uh, this workshop. Substance is great. I'm a huge fan. Have been for a long time. Um, basically, it's only real competitor as a direct suite of tools to make materials is Quixel. And they just gave away a bunch of their stuff for free, so that's great, but I'm not going to be talking too much about them today because it's only free if you're using Unreal Engine. And not. Um, Substance is also free for everybody here, if, assuming that you're all enrolled at NC State. So they give away a free educational license. I'm not sure if that's going to continue to be true because Adobe has bought Substance. Wow. Oh, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, go grab it while you can. Um, so they have put out a very interesting article here about making your own material scanning setup. And you can see there's some cardboard tubes, there's a mat, and your phone. And essentially, this is using a multi-angle uh, capture process where you're going to be taking that light, running it around at eight different angles, and then taking those captures, throwing them into Substance Designer and generating the material. So if anybody wants to play around with this, I'm planning to assemble one of these pretty soon. I'll try to bring it by the club so we can mess with it. But it's a pretty simple process. Um, we're essentially taking these multi-angle photographs so that we can generate a normal map and we can generate a lot of other maps from there. Uh, a really well-made normal map is kind of worth its weight in gold as far as making materials go. Um, if you're authoring materials using Substance Designer, making a height map is usually the first most important step to completing material. So we can get down here a little further. Brother maps. Uh, you can see that they're taking all of these things and throwing it into a node in Substance Designer. We'll take a look at that more closely in a moment. And some things I wanted to highlight here is that they're getting their normal map basically for free. They're able to run it through a tiling setup and get their tiling. Um, height mapping is pretty pretty direct. You're going to see the roughness here is a little bit, a little bit weird. Um, there isn't really a set perfect way to get roughness from a material. It's going to depend on the individual material, what the topology is like. Uh, there are a few research papers about ways to like cast light on a material at different angles and get information about roughness that way. Uh, what they're doing here is using a height map and then essentially assigning different levels to that height map in order to, to sort of get a different specularity at different depths. Uh, and if you look at the material they're making, which is this uh, leather material here, it kind of makes sense. Um, it's going to be a bit more rough on the surface. Well, it's going to be a bit more rough, uh, smooth on the surface and rougher in the cracks. Uh, if we go down here and look at this sort of uh, woven mesh that they're doing, they actually don't even bother to make a roughness map here. See, it's just kind of over here on its own being slightly gray. 
So photogrammet or photogrammetric processes, it's tempting to think of them as a magic bullet. Um, in reality, you usually have to tweak them a little bit and think a lot about the texture that you're capturing. And there's another article down here on 80 level. Um, I'm going to leave that where it is for now, but I will recommend 80 level is an awesome place to look up any information about visual 3D and material work. They have some really awesome articles uh, coming from industry veterans on tutorials and retrospectives, and it's, it's real information about uh, games in progress, and it's just great. I'm going to go ahead and pull up a photogrammetric pro uh, project that I'm working on right now. Uh, we're taking a look at Umstead Park. Um, as a place to capture different materials and objects uh, for a, material, uh, a geology course that's currently in progress. Um, and I went out there a while back, nearly broke my ankles, and took a few pictures of log using my uh, cell phone camera here. So if we go into modeling, and this is the part where I'm really going to regret not having a mouse. Do you have a <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Windows. So you can see that the surface of this is pretty simple. Um, I think this comes out to about a thousand, two thousand polygons. Uh, the original mesh that was piped out of um, Agisoft, uh, photo or Agisoft Metashape was about 2 million polygons. So this had to be retopoed pretty heavily. If we go back into object mode. Better just go ahead and keep the HDRI on here. Um, you can see we get a lot of that same detail here. So it doesn't really look like it has 2,000 polygons, it's looking a little bit closer to that much more high resolution mesh. Uh, so this is mainly because we were, or I was able to bake down a lot of this material um, using the light, or using uh, cycles in Blender. So this has a color map, a normal map, and a height map. It's all generated uh, from a, a more, or a higher density mesh. So a height map might be more appropriate using tessellation. I just threw a quick displace modifier on here just to see what it was going to look like. Um, seems to help a little bit, but not quite in the vein that I'm looking for. Can we exactly this we can? Oh yeah. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. <laughs> yeah, that. Into the board. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, perfect looking material here. Um, <laughs> lots of fun. And that's just from a texture, you're not modeling it up. So this is fully fully parametric. We're just using a texture and we're telling every single vertex in this thing to jump to a particular position. Um, and if we turn this off, so we're we're adding some geometry up the pipeline up the modifier stack in order to get enough geometry to actually displace. Otherwise, it, it gets a little bit more messy, even if we weren't at a really weird strength. So at some point, um, I'd love to talk more about photogrammetry, but I think that for the sake of moving along, we can go ahead and go to the next bunch of workflow procedural generation. So I, I mentioned Substance Designer earlier. One of the most powerful things you can do in Substance Designer is create a node network that can fully par uh, that can make the creation of these materials fully parametric. There are a lot of huge benefits to this, uh, being able to art direct materials over time, being able to make massive changes um, without any issues to the, or without having to run through the entire pipeline again. In this case, I mean, 
if you wanted to do anything to this wall, it's a node graph change. And I mean, you're starting with a completely blank slate here. So if we go ahead and take a look, this is also another artist on ArtStation. When you make materials that are this just advanced, how often is that used in like the industry though? It depends. So if you're making a film and you need a hero shot of a building, this might be a reasonable way to go. Yeah. Um, there are other cases where you might need some highly parametric environment. You know, you might not necessarily need that to be interactable, but having something that's really high fidelity makes sense. Well, like the spider man game. Yeah. Oh, Talk about please. the windows in the spider man game. Oh, so that's more of a shader yeah. technique. So um, we actually use something like that for one of our grants. It's a cube mapping process where you can simulate a cube space on a flat plane uh, by essentially mapping out the space. Um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to, to remember how that works, but I'm not, I'm not great at it. So the long and short of it is you can take a, a flat space and a map that essentially corresponds to a UV map of the cube Mm -hmm. and map out an interior space from different angles. So depending on your viewing angle, you'll get a different mapping of that, that image. And is it like better for the game's performance to go through all that work? It depends. Um, so there was a point at which like poly count was a very big part of how games determined their budget for performance, uh, especially when it came to artwork and art direction. That's kind of changed. It's still an important part of things. You're not going to throw a two million polygon uh, doorknob in your game unless you want to crash. Um, but at this point, the shader complexity can make a big difference. Uh, how many passes you need to run through in order to get a particular effect. Um, as far as Windows goes, yeah, you're probably going to save a ton of draw calls. Um, and in most cases, you just don't need to actually model out that interior. You can get a lot of detail using that technique. Um, in some cases, things like ray marching in real time, you don't tend to see a lot of that just kind of in the game by itself or as a, a feature uh, because it tends to be very expensive. So I have downloaded a material from Substance Source to take a look at here. Here's my wonderful Ooh. background again. Why clicking scene instantly turned it into a cylinder? Right, high level. at least organized. The tile random. The idea of how to generate your mortar. Unfortunately, Substance Source is not free under the educational license. Um, but there is Substance Share, which is a free database of substance materials. And you can go in there and get a, a few really well-made um, substance maps, too, to play with. How is substance source different from substance design? Um, so substance source and substance share are two different uh, databases for materials made in substance. Um, one of them costs money, the other one's free. Uh, and the one that, that you have to pay for has some pretty insane... This isn't software, this is like the place where you've got it, the material. Right. Okay. Oh. Uh, no, I was thinking. It's a library. Yep. 
And these are all these are all sets of <laughs> textures. These are not like meshes at all. Um, you can so we're using tessellation in order to get or take a height map and model this out parametrically. Get some that Victorian ceiling. Go back to that one. If you had like could just change one slider of like the shape of those in game, you'd get some crazy stuff. Yeah. And uh, Substance does have an in-engine plugin for Unity. It's yeah. it's less of a real-time thing and more of a, a bake on location kind of deal, but still still potentially useful in some cases, especially when you want to make some changes and export your maps without having to go through the full pipeline. Yeah. see a lot in all of these generative models is a whole lot of noise um, from a lot of different sources, everything from Perlin to cloud. And essentially they're taking a function that generates this noise and it's mapping everything out to a texture. And just all kinds of different ways to combine these things until you end up with stuff on the right side of this graph. Uh, oh, and another point that I had, I had made before, um, whenever I was looking at learning more about Substance Designer, one of the things that they tell you to do first is build your height map. Uh, you can generate a lot of things from, from that particular texture. Uh, in this case, all of the color that's being done here is basically right up here. And compared to the size of the entire graph, it's pretty small. <laughs> so the majority of this is building the uh, surface height and then other things can be kind of built from there. And we've got Substance Painter. Um, another Substance item. And I've gone ahead and put Suzanne in here because why not? Um, all right, uh, for those not familiar, this is the default monkey from Blender. Uh, one of the one of the more important default primitives. Um, not really. You'll never use this thing unless you're teaching a workshop in 24 hours and you throw something into substance. <laughs> I don't like the unwrapped Suzanne and not metal. Yeah, <laughs> that's the most basic that's that's ceremonial thing. fungal mess. <laughs> <laughs> you, I guess, you would have to unwrap the end video game character face. I guess. Oh I no! Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna make this worse. <laughs> 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 Uh, you gotta make the eyes that pure brass after this. <laughs> it's like you have a brass oh, monkey and you just cover it in a cloth. Ew, yeah, I like don't. Like it. Oh, is the color procedural too? It might be. I don't know. I'm not supposed to be much. I just thought I'd play. <laughs> uh, oh, and then we've got um, plenty of different skins available. So we go over here, we've got like calf skin. Oh no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> human no. Human feet. No. Human feet. Uh, the most useful plastic table. <laughs> okay. that's, that's a little less, oh, little less bad. Are these all included with the substance container? They are. So these are all using the uh, default materials. On my Halloween costume. <laughs> Uh, you can also make things in Substance Designer and bring them into Painter. Um, so usually that would be your workflow, even if you're trying to take uh, textures made in something else. Can so, you elaborate on the difference between Painter and Designer? Uh, designer is more of a, a methodology to, to, to author material specifically. Mm. So when you're working in Designer, you're using nodes to create a set of images, but also rules to generate those images. Um, and that gives you a material that you can then bring into Substance Painter. Uh, you can continue to tweak things there, so you get an SBAR out of this, which is like a package for Substance Designer. And you can set up your materials here uh, throughout this process so that you can tweak them later on in Painter. Um, Painter is kind of where your mesh is going to meet your material as far as the Substance Suite is, is uh, concerned. So it's where you do your painting, um, it's where you can define different uh, boundaries between different materials. Um, and all kinds of other crazy things like smart materials and uh, masking things out here. Anyway, back to materials and textures. Um, 
This is where we can start to bake out some things in uh, Substance Painter. Bake everything. All right, so talked a little bit about procedural generation and kind of a really brief and kind of haphazard, very haphazard overview of what that might look like. Um, so there's still one more uh, as potential aspect of material creation that I haven't really gone too much over. That's creating materials by hand. So there's kind of two different workflows on display here. Um, on the right, there is a, uh, a demonstration of how you can creatively use UV mapping uh, in order to create some really awesome materials. Um, the person who creates this goes by Minions Art, and I had to Google that earlier today. Oh no! <laughs> I didn't think about it before I did this. <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I'm going to connect their Patreon here, that way I can share this slideshow with everyone, so you don't have to do that. Um, but uh, they have a lot of great posts that they put on their Twitter that ends up on Pinterest because people don't care about whether or not creators want them to do things. Um, so if you go on Pinterest and look up Minions Art, you might find this, or you might find Art of Minions. Um, reasonable trade-off. So here's my other thing I've got up here in Blender. Uh, Uh, so this was just a test to try to see if I could replicate that same kind of look um, using the razor that you guys saw at the beginning of the slideshow like an hour ago. Sure. And it's just textured using two gradients. There's nothing fancy here. It's just just those colors. And if I go back to my shading settings, there we go. The mode. Like some portion of this. Mm -hmm. Like that. Well, go here, grab that. Control L. Oh, right. See, I would know how to do this if I went to Alberto's. <laughs> I did talk about the meeting thing. No, I said don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> so here you can move these things around, scale them. And really, you're looking at less of an accurate UV mapping at this point, as opposed to just ways to take this this gradient and start to mess with it. So for instance, if we wanted to really mess this up, or just change the material over here, and that looks a little bit like it's got a wooden top piece to it too. The seam is now messed up, but just not, not look at it <laughs> It's fine. Honestly, it's not as bad as I thought it would look. <laughs> How does this affect the lighting? Um, if you're going for a workflow like this, you probably want to use an unlit shader. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, basically, my answer is poorly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> because you're baking in your lighting, essentially, in this way. Um, and if you're going to go you know, fully into this kind of workflow, you might want to do something like baking out your ambient occlusion in Blender and then just bringing that into to whatever uh, environment you're working on. So you just bake your lighting entirely, which is kind of what this guy did. And this is one of the things on ArtStation that blows my mind and makes me wish that I had a lot more time to spend on doing this kind of stuff. Wow. Oh. So this was, and he's, he's making a sales pitch here, so I'm gonna try to skip most of this. But essentially, he's going into the process of creating oh. this mesh, creating the normal maps, baking out the ambient occlusion, and using all of these different, uh, more advanced, like PBR style workflow uh, in order to create a better hand painted texture. So, one of the cooler things I've seen on ArtStation, I kind of wish I would have grabbed it before I started, or I had put it in the slideshow, and I'd throw it into Slack later. Uh, there's someone I saw recently who was using a normal map sphere to paint. Uh, directly, so he was kind of sampling off of a normal map sphere, and he, he painted, I think it was a portrait of Martha, Martin Luther King using the normal map vectors, and then he was able to relight it from different angles. All right, so we've hit about 8 p.m. Um, I'm going to try not to go too much further over this, but for those of you who d downloaded Materialize, uh, if you want to try making a material real quick, um, something that's really fun about that program, 
you can just go in, drop in a single uh, color map, and it will generate everything else for you. <laughs> Let's try this. <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and grab one that I took while I was over at Umstead Park. And I'm actually going to need to download this real quick. So material, that's the one that works with the photos? Yes. Cool. And um, Substance Is any picture Alchemist is another <laughs> part of the Substance suite you can use to do some some really cool stuff with that too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I've talked, uh, I've evangelized Substance enough for one day, I think, so I'll go ahead and leave that for now. Can we use any picture we want? Or do, do we have like you know, some requirements? There are definitely some requirements. Um, so when you're selecting a picture, I'll go ahead and back over to this one for reference. There he is. You're going to want to Firstly, get as little shading in there as possible. You kind of want to get something that's going to be basically flat. Um, anything that's going to generate a material from one image is going to want as little other lighting and shading data in there as possible. Um, you're going to want something that's coplanar, so you want your camera to be facing directly downward or directly outward at that, that material. So we talked about normal vectors before. If you get your camera on that normal vector, then you're doing well. Uh, and it really helps to have a high resolution image because you're going to be getting a lot of information from this. What happens if they don't get used material that doesn't have those things? You will get mixed results. Perfect. Alright, so. Alright, second vector. Is it going to be a square? I can, make it, I can make it square with my expensive paint on that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think so. Uh, but I do know that it will clip down different resolutions. So we're going to start by opening up our diffuse map, hitting the, the O. I don't really know what that was either for a minute, but that is what it is. And we're going to grab our texture, let's select, let's select. And now we've got awesome color data, not much else. Go over here and create our height map. Now, in most cases, since you're using a height map for, well, that's much worse than it was before. Uh, <laughs> in most cases, since you're using a height map to do some kind of parametric modeling, you don't want it to be super noisy. You usually want something that's a little bit, I, I hesitate to say blurry, but you don't want a ton of high, high level grain in that. Otherwise, you might get some really weird artifacts. So we're going to play around with the frequency, uh, frequency equalizer here a little bit. So what is each slider kind of? represent compared to each other. So in the uh, equalizer, we're essentially using different frequencies of grayscale information uh, to generate either a more or less light uh, uh, region. So over here, you'll see that a lot of the very largest scale changes happen. And once we get down here, we're seeing a lot of granularity. How do we, can we just drag and drop a picture into it? Does that work? I don't think so. Sorry. I could be wrong. Uh, my my knowledge of this is pretty <laughs> limited. I've used, used it successfully uh, once. <laughs> can you show how to open a picture? You hit the O. O. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, that's what he did. Didn't set that as our height. Go ahead and generate our other maps. I'm going to go to normal next. When you're doing that height map, what are you looking for to get that optimal phase? So when we're looking at a height map, yes. here, it's pretty, uh, when we're looking at a height map, the, the important thing is that um, anything that's darker is going to be further down. Anything that's lighter is going to be further up. So we want to make sure we're getting the extraction from different levels of detail that we want. So you'll see that since we've got some sand, we've got a little bit of graininess in some of these regions here. We've also got our rocks, so they're going to be a little bit higher up than the sand is. Um, so essentially we're kind of thinking about this like we're 3D modeling this. You know, what's going to be the tallest, what's going to be in the mid-range, and what's going to fall out. How do you generate your effects? Go to create. Um, yeah, I clicked few. Why did you, well, I, I, I don't know what that is. Too, I don't know. Are you so cool? Mm -hmm. Set as high? Yeah, that would be good. Oh, hey. Mm -hmm. 
and then we're going to make our normals. Um, um, normal maps are kind of uh, the opposite of height maps in terms of detail. Instead of wanting something that's a little more blurry and bold and defined, we're going to want as much detail as we can get. Um, usually to the point we'll crank up the contrast pretty high. Because most applications are going to give you some level of control over how much the normal map is going to contribute to your lighting. Um, and as a result, having a more intense, more accurate normal map um, to start with is usually advantageous. Do you change the angularity? Angularity? Um, I bumped that up a little bit. It looks like what it's doing is like altering the intensity on a different, different scale. I wouldn't overdo that though. about before. Um, material is usually in the real world. Well, it's always in the real world, either dielectric or it's metallic. Uh, it's not really going to be both. What metalness maps allow you to do, though, is create a material that might have elements of both in it. So if I was to drop a metal screw into this environment take a photograph of that, I would want that to have uh, metalness of one. I'd want everything else to have metalness of zero. Um, but for this, we don't really want any of this to be metallic. I'm just going to Zero. Um, and metalness workflows. Uh, <laughs> for metallics, uh, anything that is completely black is not metal. Anything that's completely white uh, is metal. And you can blend the two to, to represent uh, natural blends, things like uh, differences in elevation. So if I bury the screw under some sand, um, having some gray portions might make more sense. Did you say zero was the top? You slid them off and set it to zero. Is the top zero in the software? In some cases. Oh. <laughs> so how would you isolate? How, how would you isolate just like say if you dropped a screw in there? How would you isolate just that one little screw to, in order just to make that one part metallic? So here, I don't know. In Substance Designer, you might be able to get a, a mask around the screw. Um, the long and short of it. Uh, if you were going to create that from a photograph, you might have to do some custom work. So you might have to bring that into Photoshop and just mess with it. Uh, it really depends on, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, since this picture is not metallic, is it possible just not to add a metallic map to it? That's, that's kind of what we're doing here. In this program, I don't know that you can just tell it not to use a metallic map. Again, okay, you might so find you have to use all maps. Huh? You have to use oh, all the maps in it. Um, I don't like it. So, because this is working in Unity, I'm going to assume it's running through the standard shader. In the standard shader, if you don't assign anything to metalness, that's essentially the same as making it entirely uh, render entirely black pixels, because that's what's going to go through the shader. <laughs> um, say less or more. Not shiny. Oh. So when we look at the smoothness map, <laughs> so anything that's going to be a lighter color or up to a white in the smoothness map is going to be more smooth. <coughs> this also might be roughness. Roughness and smoothness are roughly interchangeable. Wait, you said white is more Yep. Wait, so to make it less shiny, you'd make it more white? To make it less shiny, you'd want to make it less white. Like some of these things might be it's better to show here. We'll try to so much pitch map. So when they say edge map here, uh, I'm gonna make the assumption that that's roughly interchangeable with like a a, a curve map. Um, and that can be used for things like generating snow for some smart materials. Um, so ambient occlusion map, we're essentially going to be doing a uh, bake on all of this based off the material itself. And that bake is going to be computed usually with our diffuse map in order to give it some shadow um, that we don't have to create with our light mapper or our real-time lighting engine. 
And now we can hit show the material. And that's what we end up with. Okay, so <laughs> this starts off giving like a lot of priority to height map. We can go in here and change our show the camera. parallax displacement oh, show and the camera. Just move that down a little bit. We'll see it in a different concrete here. Wow. It's my favorite mug. Could you wait? Could you generate a mesh from this? Yes. Um, you could take the height map off of this, go into Blender, make a sphere, use the displace modifiers. Are you kidding? And, and really print it. Yeah. Really? This is actually we're looking at uh, using GIS data to do similar things to this. I don't like, I don't like that. So everything here is basically going to be part of your shader, or uh, if you're in in uh, Unity, this will be other parts of your material, just like sliders, vertical <laughs> input. Um, but this is a really nice free way to create some really quick materials using a single image. Um, if you go out and take your own uh, pictures, you can get build a library pretty quickly this way. Does the software automatically make it tileable too? No, this one won't automatically make it tileable. Um, so Substance Alchemist and Designer have abilities to make things tileable. So I, again, I'd recommend uh, go take a look at the Substance Educational License. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, it's an awesome workflow. Um, what's the extension for Unity Materials? Uh, for Unity Materials? Yeah, like what's the, that, uh, what's the extension? Super um, so Unity stores its materials in .blink files uh, with everything else. So it's kind of like an FBX where it's an omnibus file. Um, if you wanted to move materials from one place to another, your best bet for like quick portability would be to store the textures themselves or an S-bar. So uh, when you're done with the texture, you materialize uh, Save it as a uh, you would save it as a set of textures. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this back up. Uh, <laughs> Which button do you press to re-edit one of the uh, the maps? Or wait. Is it clear that created? Oh my gosh. Oh, wait. oh yeah. So if I have an old height map, create. Okay. I want to just clear and uh, recreate it. I think so. You you just download each of these, and once you create a new material, you add each of those to like the little box next to the setting. I'm gonna. Uh, in Unity, when you create a new material, when you have like all those textures. Right. Once all the that. textures are created, um, I'll just pull Blender back up here. Actually, this this would be a good case to get the log back out. <laughs> We've returned the log. Um, <laughs> Whenever you click on your in the uh, properties window, you're going to have a, a sphere that looks like it's got kind of a, a target on it here. Click on that. This is your materials uh, window, and you can go up and hit the plus button, and you'll add a new material. Um, from there, you can go into the shading tab and edit the material, the material node here. So this is about the simplest. Uh, setup you can have for a material. We've got a color map that's going into base color. And down here we've got a normal map node uh, coming off of our normal map import. And that's going into our output. Is that? Okay, so you have more nodes to decide. Uh, right. Um, okay, I was, I was talking about more unity, like when you create a material unity. Uh, and add the textures in. You add them to the standard shader in that material. <coughs> right. So let me bring this up real quick. Still work. I'm assuming everything doesn't freeze. Wait. Did you, did you save dog sphere? I didn't bother saving that dog sphere. No. It was generated. Unity's frozen. We'll return to it later. Oh wait. No. Okay. Cool. material for this log, uh, we could right click, create, and material. Um, since this log is coming out of Blender and it already has material on it, we 
can also go into our import settings, go into materials, and extract them. Just go over here. I'm going to delete this because I'm not using it at this point. Not undo this action. That's fine. I'm going to drag in my color map. Normal map. Ambient occlusion. And height. So, one thing I should highlight about Unity is that there are multiple render pipelines. A uh, high, high output, high definition render pipeline is going to have a different set of import textures. Um, but here we're not actually using a render pipeline, we're using the older method, which is to use the default pipeline. Is going to make my life a little bit easier because I can work with a default shader. This is actually the lightweight pipeline. I just lied to you. Um, so the lightweight pipeline is a little bit closer to the older older workflow. Just throw on our base map. <laughs> That's sad. That's really true. We <laughs> want a place for a height map here, so. It's just a bunch of content, and they couldn't put the tree. <laughs> um, one other thing that might be important to note about the way that Unity packs uh, material information, it's going to derive your roughness or smoothness map from the alpha on your base map. So that basically means instead of, a, instead of having a fully different map, you're usually going to need to throw it into the same file. Um, and I'll go over that real quick if anybody wants to see it, uh, but otherwise I'll, I'll just keep it. So this is what that's going to look like once we've got it into Unity. Um, go ahead and click on our light source here. Well, that didn't that much. So that would be how you would go about adding that material here. There's a few other workflows possible. Uh, if you have the Substance plugin for Unity, you can just throw a Substance material onto it, make your changes, and it'll update the object. Um, but for the most part, you're going to be dragging your textures into the, the project workspace and assigning them to a material uh, in order to create new uh, materials for individual objects. Um, is that kind of what you wanted to...? No, I, no, I understand that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that answered my question. Okay, just wanted to make sure that I got, I got all that. Uh, I forgot, you said that you mentioned uh, something about the. Like, I mentioned something after. Uh, like, if anyone had any questions about uh, the right. last map in, or. Um, if anyone wanted to know how I would go about uh, baking or integrating the roughness texture into the diffuse texture, I could show you how I would go about doing that. But I feel it's something where we probably wouldn't remember it <laughs> if you showed it to us right now with all the new things. Um, maybe I'll try to just write it up real quick and throw it in Slack later. I think that might be more useful. All right. So we've gone through a few different uh, ways that we can create materials, um, and a lot of information, probably more than anybody wanted to know for the moment about how materials work. And also we have viewed the most disturbing rendering of Suzanne I've ever seen in my life. Um, so what else is there out there? What, what else could we talk about potentially later on? Um, UV mapping. We didn't really talk much about topology or UV mapping tonight, uh, other than showing a little bit about how we can use it for stylization. It's important. Um, when we look at Unity in particular, uh, there are other ways to enhance the, uh, the graphic abilities of Unity in particular. One thing is Uber. Uh, it's uh, talking about the car service. Um, it's a standard shader that gives you access to things like tessellation, uh, dynamic snow, rain, and wetness maps. Uh, Amplify Shader Editor makes shaders a lot more accessible and visually recognizable. Um, shader Graph is a new feature that's upcoming in Unity, specifically made for the render pipelines. Uh, and Alberto was asking earlier today about light map baking. Um, bakery is a really great way to make that more reasonable and make, uh, make it a faster process. I'm going to send these slides out, so Everybody will have this if they want to look at these things up in the asset store later. 
Uh, Post-processing and screen space shaders. So you can operate shaders on the entire screen space itself. That's usually how you get things like bloom, uh, depth of field, and other post-processing uh, effects. Um, graphics profiling. So again, shaders don't come for free. Uh, these materials have uh, impact on the performance of your game. There are various ways to look at these things in Unity and get more information about them. Um, the frame debugger is a really great way to learn exactly what, what's happening in your draw calls. Uh, blend shapes and Alembic caches. Sometimes you want your geometry to change in more extreme ways than you're going to get from a material. Those are some techniques that you can use to get some really intricate animation involving changes to your mesh. And visual effects and particles. So when you look at most shaders, we're thinking about what the surface treatment is going to be. Visual effects are going to give us some more potential items, things like glow, uh, fade in. Um, particle systems can get into things like fur, leaves, hair on monkeys, I guess. Um, these are kind of where all these things branch out into. All right, uh, thanks for letting me bend your ear for an hour and a half. If anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to go over any specifics. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. I do want you to show me how to save this material through the <coughs> material lines, if that works. Right. Um, there's an S on each note. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that'll let you save it. Okay, so you just save them all individually. Yep.